So let's take a look at sequences. Now sequences, all that is, is just a list of terms. So let's say we have a sequence that is written as a sub n. Now if a sub n is equal to a sequence, the first term in the sequence is just regarded as a sub 1. So all that means is we plug in 1 for n into the sequence and we find what the first term is. So then we have a sub 1, comma a sub 2, a sub 3, and we go on and so forth. So obviously a sub 2 would be the second term of the sequence when we plug in 2 for n, and then a sub 3 would be the third term of the sequence, and then we go on obviously. Now in the next section we'll talk about series. And so the difference between a sequence and a series, well obviously I just listed out the sequence is just a list of terms. Well what a series is, is the sum of the listed terms. So we basically take a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3 and we go on forever. So that's going to be the difference between a sequence and a series. So for these first set of problems, let's go ahead and list the first five terms of the sequence. So for number 1 we have a sub n equals 3 times negative 1 to the n over n factorial. So obviously a sequence once again is just a list of terms. So let's go ahead and list out the first five terms. So starting with the first term a sub 1. All we're going to do is plug in 1 for n into that sequence that's given to us. So when we plug in 1 for n, we get 3 times negative 1 to the first, which is just negative 1, over 1 factorial. Now 1 factorial is just going to be 1, so then we have negative 3 over 1, which is going to be equal to negative 3. So that is going to be the first term in the sequence. So now a sub 2, the second term in the sequence, we're going to plug in 2 for n. So we have 3 times negative 1 squared over 2 factorial. So then we have negative 1 squared is 1, so we have 3 over 2 factorial, which is 2 times 1, which is 2. So that's going to be the second term of the sequence. Now for the third term of the sequence, a sub 3, once again we're going to plug in 3 for n, so we have 3 times negative 1 cubed over 3 factorial. Now 3 times negative 1 cubed, negative 1 cubed is negative 1, negative 1 times 3 is negative 3, over 3 factorial, which is 3 times 2 times 1, which is 6. So, and we can simplify that down to negative 1 half. So that is going to be the third term in the sequence. Now let's go ahead and list out the first three terms. So a sub 1, the first term is negative 3. a sub 2 obviously is going to be 3 halves. And then a sub 3 is going to be negative 1 half. So now if I erase this, let's go ahead and find the fourth term in the sequence, or in other words, a sub 4. Now a sub 4, we're going to plug in 4 for n. So we have 3 times negative 1 to the fourth over 4 factorial. So then that's going to equal 3 times negative 1 to the 4th is 1, so we have 3 times 1, which is 3, over 4 factorial, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is going to be 24. And then we can go ahead and simplify that down to 1 over 8. So the 4th term of the sequence is 1 over 8. And then let's go ahead and find the 5th term of the sequence. Once again, we're going to plug in 5 for n. a sub 5 is going to be 3 times negative 1 to the 5th over 5 factorial. Negative 1 to the 5th is negative 1. Negative 1 times 3 is negative 3 over 5 factorial. 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. That's going to give us 120. And then we can go ahead and simplify that down to negative 1 over 120 divided by 3 is 40. So that is going to be the fifth term in the sequence, negative 1 over 40. So realize also that these alternate between positive and negative numbers. And the reason why that is is because we have the alternator here, negative 1 to the n. Now for these next set of problems, we have to find a formula for the general term of the sequence. So basically we're working backwards. So now we're given a list of terms and we have to find that formula, a sub n. So the main thing obviously we have to look for is to find patterns here. So we have a sub n, that's obviously going to be the sequence, equals. Now the main pattern I see here is we have 2, 4, 8, 16. So we have 2 to the first, which is 2, 2 squared is 4, 2 cubed is 8, and then obviously 2 to the fourth is 16. So the general term for the sequence, you can write it a couple different ways. You can say 1 over 2 to the n, or you could also say 1 over 2, the entire thing to the power of n. But either way, both are acceptable answers. And you can also double check by plugging in the different terms. So obviously a sub 1, we can plug in 1 for n, and we'll get 1 over 2. Then a sub 2, we'll get 1 over 4, and so forth. So obviously that matches the sequence itself. Now for number 2 we have 1, negative 2 thirds, 4 ninths, and then negative 8 over 27. So the very first pattern I see here is that we do alternate between positive and negative numbers. So once again we need to have that alternator negative 1 to the n. Now in this case we always plug in 1 for n first. So in this case if we plug in 1 for n we'll get negative 1 to the first which is negative 1. However our first term is not negative it's positive. 
So there's two different ways we can do this. We can say n plus one, or we can say n minus one. Because if we plug in one for n, one minus one is zero, and then negative one to the zero is obviously gonna be one, which is the first term. Now in the next terms, in the numerator, we have two, four, and eight. So similar to the previous problem, we basically square two. So we have two to the first, which is two, two squared, and then two cubed. But on the denominator, we have three, nine, and 27, which follows the pattern of three to the first, three squared, and three cubed. So in this case, what I would do is for the numerator, we have two to the n, and then for the denominator, we have three to the n, because obviously it follows that pattern. Now, notice the first term is one. So when we plug in n into our sequence, we have to get a value of one. So what I would do here is if I plug in one right now, we get two to the first over three to the first, which is two thirds. That's not gonna be one. So I would have to say two to the n minus one, and then three to the n minus one. Because now, if I set that equal to a sub n to our sequence, if I plug in one and find a sub one, the first term, we get two to the one minus one, which is two to the zero, which is one, times negative one to the one minus one, that's obviously gonna be one as well, over three to the one minus one, three to the zero is one. So then we get one. Now we can also test it out by plugging in two into the sequence to find the second term, a sub two, and we'll get two to the two minus one, which is two, times negative one to the two minus one, negative one to the first is negative one, over, we get three to the two minus one, three to the first is three. So then we get negative two thirds, which is the second term. So we know that the sequence is correct here, or the general formula for the sequence is correct. Now what I'm gonna do is actually simplify the sequence. Because all the powers are the same, n minus one, n minus one, and n minus one, I can actually group them together. So I can group these two together and say two times negative one, which is negative two, the entire thing to the n minus one power over three to the n minus one power. And because we do have the same exponents on numerator and denominator, we can group these two together and put the entire thing to just the n minus one power. So I can rewrite it as a sub n, the general sequence equals negative two thirds, the entire thing to the n minus one power. And that's gonna be the formula for the general term of the sequence. Now for these next set of problems, we have to determine whether the sequence converges or diverges, and if it converges, find the limit. Now compared to series, sequences are much easier to find the limit because all we have to do in this case is set the limit to infinity. So for number one, we have a sub n equals three plus five n squared over n plus n squared. Once again, all we have to do is say the limit as n approaches infinity of our sequence, three plus five n squared over n plus n squared. Now in this case, we're just looking at the significant or the highest degrees of both the numerator and denominator. In this case, the highest degree of the numerator is n squared. The highest degree of the denominator is also n squared. Because they have the same degree, all we have to do is take the coefficients of the highest degrees. So that's gonna be five over one, which gives us the final answer of five. So the sequence will converge to what value? Well, to the value of five. Now for number two, we have a sub n equals cosine of n divided by two. Once again, all we have to do is set the limit as n approaches infinity of our general sequence here, cosine of n over two. Now if I go ahead and use direct substitution and directly plug in infinity for n, we have cosine of infinity over two. Now two is insignificant compared to infinity. So infinity over two is basically infinity. So we have cosine of infinity. Now remember that cosine is an oscillating function. So we can't necessarily tell what the end behavior of cosine is or what is the limit of cosine because once again, it oscillates. So whenever we have like cosine of infinity or sine of infinity, we basically have to say that it diverges. Now for number three, we have a sub n equals two to the n over three to the n plus one. Once again, let's go ahead and set the limit as n approaches infinity, two to the n over three to the n plus one. Now, obviously if we compare two to the n and three to the n, 3 to the n is obviously a heavier function, which tells us that this is bottom heavy and it yields a higher value than 2 to the n. Now, because this fraction is bottom heavy, if we plug in a very large value for n, the value on the denominator will be much larger than the value on the numerator. So that tells us the limit is gonna be zero. So once again, the sequence will converge to the value of zero. Now for number four, we have a sub n equals negative one to the n minus one times n over n squared plus one. If we go ahead and set the limit as n approaches infinity of once again that same exact sequence, negative one to the n minus one times n over n squared plus one. 
Now don't let the alternator confuse you because that doesn't really make much of a difference. What we're really focusing here is the highest degree of the numerator compared to the highest degree of the denominator. In this case, the highest degree of the numerator is just n to the first, but the highest degree of the denominator is n squared. Because we have a bottom heavy fraction, the limit is going to be zero. So it does converge to the value of zero. Now for number five, we have a sub n equals cosine squared of n over two to the n. So if I go ahead and once again set the limit as n approaches infinity of the same exact sequence, cosine squared of n over two to the n. Now this might look a little bit confusing at first, but realize that cosine of n just by itself oscillates between negative one and one, oscillates between those y values. And if we square that, we'll obviously get something still that's in between negative one and one. So we can basically compare this sequence to plus or minus one over two to the n. Now, as we plug in larger values for n, obviously we're gonna have a larger value on the denominator compared to the numerator. Now, because it's bottom heavy, we know the limit goes to zero. So that is what the sequence converges to. Now for number six, we have a sub n equals two n minus one factorial over two n plus one factorial. We go ahead and set the limit as n approaches infinity of once again that same exact sequence now this might look confusing at first, but there's a way we can simplify this. Now obviously a factorial, let's say we have five factorial. Obviously we do five times four times three times two times one. So let's say we have something like n factorial. Then we can rewrite it as n times n minus one times n minus two and so forth. You can go on forever. But wherever you stop, so let's say we have times n minus three, and you stop right there, you have to include the factorial with that. So obviously you're probably not going to multiply an infinite number of times, so wherever you stop that term you have to multiply by that factorial. So we can apply the same rule here to this general sequence. So we can rewrite 2n plus 1 factorial as 2n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 minus 1, which is 2n, and then times 2n minus 1, and then times 2n minus 1 minus 1, which is 2n minus 2, and we can stop right there and then include that factorial. So then on the numerator, we can rewrite 2n minus 1 factorial. We can expand it as 2n minus 1 times 2n minus 1 minus 1, which is 2n minus 2 factorial. And then we can stop right there. Now realize that the 2n minus 1s will cancel. 2n minus 2 factorials will cancel. And what we're left with here is I'll rewrite the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over 2n plus 1 times 2n. So realize that this fraction is bottom heavy, so the limit to infinity is going to be zero. Now for number seven, we have a sub n equals n factorial over two to the n. If I go ahead and write the limit as n approaches infinity of once again that exact same sequence, n factorial over two to the n. Now in order to find which one is, or if the fraction is top heavy or is bottom heavy, we can actually go ahead and graph both of these. So we can graph, instead of n factorial, let's use our graphing calculator to find x factorial, and instead of 2 to the n, let's go ahead and graph 2 to the x and see which one is a bigger graph, or which one grows exponentially faster. Now if you have graphed it, x factorial is a much faster growing graph than 2 to the x. Just think about plugging in 10 for x. 10 factorial is going to be like in the millions, while 2 to the 10th is just going to be 1024. Now because this is a much growing, faster growing graph than numerator, we can say that it's top heavy, and so the limit to infinity is basically, if I go ahead and erase this, going to go to infinity. So we know that this sequence will diverge. So once again, whenever you have trouble trying to figure out whether the numerator or the denominator grows faster, you can always try and graph it if you're allowed to use a graphing calculator.